In this video, I'd like to give an overview of two-factor authentication, and that's a uh, term you probably have heard quite frequently. So suppose that you were trying to access a service. So here you are, and you're trying to access some type of a service or a resource. For example, this may be your, your bank account, or maybe it's a, uh, a computer that you want to access, or maybe it's an email account, or, or something of that sort. Uh, and imagine we're talking about a service or resource that is restricted. So only a certain set of people are allowed to access it. For example, you wouldn't want uh, some bad guy that's not you to be able to access your bank account. So what you basically do need is a way to prove to your bank or to whatever service that you are who you say you are. Uh, and in computer security parlance, we call this notion authentication. Authentication. Okay, so how do you go about achieving authentication? Well, there are a few different mechanisms that you can, you can leverage. Uh, for starters, you can authenticate yourself via what we call something you know. Something you know. So if you leave, and I'll tell you why I'm going to write it this way. Something you, and here is no. Okay, and what is an example of something you know? Well, for example, that could be a, uh, a password. Uh, it could be an ATM pin number. It could be a combination, like if you had a physical combination lock, something of that sort, some, some secret that you have that only you are supposed to know. Okay, and the premise here is that ideally only you know your password. So if a service is accessed by somebody who provides the correct password or PIN or, or can open up a combination lock, then there's a good chance that the person who is accessing that service is authorized to do so. And, and that's not a terrible assumption. It'll be true most of the time. And, and that's, the key word here is most. I mean, there are going to be situations in which that's not true all the time. For example, some people get their password stolen, or maybe there's a data breach, or a phishing attack, or something of that nature. Or maybe even somebody was as strict or socially engineered into giving away their password to a scammer. Uh, some people write their passwords on paper, and then that paper might get lost or stolen, etc. And so, uh, clearly passwords are you know, better than nothing, but they're not ideal. And so what are some other mechanisms you can use to authenticate yourself that, that might be more useful in this regard? So something else you can do is, is something you have something you have and an example of something you might have is let's say an atm card okay a physical atm card maybe it, it can be your phone okay that's another example of something you have um it could be a smart card it could be a hardware token and, and you often see the the notion of a hardware token in association with two-factor authentication and so the idea is is there is that you basically uh and really the premise is ultimately that you or only you should theoretically possess your ATM card. So if that particular ATM card is entered into an ATM machine, then there's a good chance that the person putting that card in the machine is a legitimate person who's supposed to have that card. And that legitimate person is, is the one who's allowed access to a particular bank account, etc. Now, of course, if you, even if you have a physical item, there is a chance that a physical item uh, could get stolen, so that also has a drawback as well. And that kind of leads to a third category of authentication mechanisms, namely, something you are something you are and an example of something you are the classic example the canonical example is a biometric a biometric and examples of biometrics include things like fingerprints or maybe even a retinal scan of some sort okay uh, and now the nice thing with the biometric in terms of security is that you can't lose your biometric you can't lose your fingerprint you can't lose your your retina um, at least not not in any sane fashion and so the idea is that you can't lose it the same way that you might lose an ATM card or that you might forget a password. But having said that, biometrics themselves do have their own set of drawbacks. And for example, they can be very expensive to implement. They have privacy considerations. They're not entirely impervious to being forged. And, and there are some, some very subtle, uh, subtle issues with, with biometrics as well. Now, when we talk about the notion of two-factor authentication, what we really mean is that you should basically use, instead of just using one of these factors to authenticate yourself, you should use two distinct factors to authenticate yourself, at least two distinct factors. Okay, two distinct factors. Uh, so for example, um, something you know and something you have, or something you know and something you are, maybe something you have and something you are, etc. Uh, you also sometimes see two-factor authentication abbreviated as 2FA or TFA. Uh, and also sometimes you hear about multi-factor authentication, MFA, and these are all Although MFA could mean more than two factors, and typically when we talk about two-factor authentication, we mean exactly two factors. And maybe I, I can give an example or maybe an illustration. So 
Uh, a nice example might be uh, an ATM card. So in, in, when you talk about automated teller machines or ATMs, um, the idea is that if you wanted, let's say, to withdraw money from your bank account, uh, and, and let's say this was an ATM, um, you'd have to provide two things. You have to first insert your card into the system, and then you've got to provide your PIN number. Okay, so you're providing two pieces of information, your card and your PIN. Okay, the card is something that you have, okay? And the PIN is something that you know, a secret that you know. And it's the corroboration, the combination of these two elements that allow you to authenticate yourself. And then the premise, again, is that by corroborating two authentication mechanisms, you should theoretically get better security than if you only had just one mechanism. Uh, after all, it, it should be unlikely that someone could both gain knowledge of your password or your PIN number and also gain physical access to your ATM card. Okay? Now, I do want to stress here that two-factor authentication is defined as authenticating yourself with two distinct factors. It's got to be distinct, and this is a very key, key qualifier here. It just cannot be two factors that are the same. So, for example, um, you, you can't have two passwords and call that two-factor authentication. I've actually seen people do that before in the past. Uh, two-factor authentication doesn't mean having two passwords. It means having a password in conjunction with maybe something you have or something you are. Okay? Now, one last point I do want to make is that one way in which two-factor authentication is implemented, a very common mechanism for implementing two-factor authentication is via what we call the hardware token. Okay? Uh, now, some people get confused. They, they think that hardware tokens, and you may, may have seen these kind of tokens, they're basically physical devices and, and they have some numbers on them and the numbers are kind of constantly changing. Uh, and, and maybe I'll do another video in more detail on hardware tokens, but I think that the main, the main thing I do want to point out is that you shouldn't conflate the idea of a hardware token with the idea of two-factor authentication. Hardware token is basically one particular implementation. Okay? Two-factor authentication in general would refer to any general mechanism where two of the three factors I talked about, something you know, something you are, and something you have, are, are combined. And a hardware token is just one instantiation or implementation that achieves that more general notion of two-factor authentication.